Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with Joan Brown, OSF, who is the executive director of the New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light. Uh, to talk about climate change, water, alternative energy, uh, immigrant children from the perspective of uh, uh, communities of faith around the country, all kinds of, of communities of faith. Uh, Joan is a Franciscan sister from uh, a community in Rochester, Minnesota. She's lived in New Mexico for 20 years, I believe, or yes, so. Yes, at least. Um, and um, she uh, received an MA from the California Institute of Integral Studies, where she worked with, among many others, the great Buddhist environmentalist, uh, Joanna Macy. Um, she's been um, working long and hard uh, in uh, farming communities and has a deep, deep commitment to... Um, the Sacred Earth uh, community and movement around the world. It's really an honor to have you with us, and I'm just, a, just so happy we get to talk about these matters from from your perspective. Well, um, D.B., thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you and have this time to chat. And, uh, yes, I've been, I, I guess, you know, maybe it'd be good to say how I got involved in all of this. Please. And... Um, it's two things. I come from a farm background in Kansas, and um, so that's deep in me. So I've always had this um, not a, a real love for the earth and for the people, the communities that live in various regions, bioregions. And then I also have a sister who has Down syndrome. And so um, people who are differently challenged um, teach us a lot, and she's taught me a lot. But one of the things I keep remembering is... Um, she has a hard time communicating, and so she'll be in a circle, and people aren't listening to her, and she'll say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, you're not listening to me, excuse me, excuse me, you're not listening to me. So finally I say, yes, what do, what do you want to say? And so she'll say this. So in terms of the environment and climate change now and caring for the earth, I feel that's where we're at. Um, there are voices of those who are economically challenged around the world and here in our state, uh, the voices of the creatures, of the water, the elements, and uh, the, the sacred voice within us and God saying to us, you're not listening, you're not listening, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And so that keeps ringing through me and um, it's a very good message for, for me to continue to hear and, and that's part of the work that I do then is just uh, helping people listen, wake up, listen and act um, to care for creation and climate change. And so I do that with New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light uh, as one of the venues. And as executive director, New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light, we've been here in New Mexico about seven years. And um, we are one of 40 uh, state affiliates. And the whole movement uh, began with an Episcopal minister, Sally Bingham, in California about 13 years ago. And she uh, saw that climate change was the most important moral and ethical issue of our time and related to all these other concerns. Um, and yet she saw that people of faith were not engaged in yeah, that issue. Yeah. And they weren't caring for creation as their many uh, traditions speak to them saying that they, they need to. Yeah. And so she started in California and um, it got the name Power and Light because they were doing energy things with uh, <laughs> faith communities. And so the name just sort of is there, and you can take it on several levels, power and light in terms of energy, and then the power and light, which is the energy, the spiritual energy in all the faith traditions as well. So that's how it started and has moved, and so we're here in New Mexico. You're in 40 states. You, uh, you try to, as I understand it, be a broad spectrum, if you will, spiritually. Uh, you try to involve, involve everyone. And you're a Franciscan nun. And uh, uh, Franciscans have a, have a very powerful view of the natural world, at least I've been led to believe that, or um, having a chance to read a lot of his, mm -hmm. his works, I guess you could call them. So what, what, is, um, what, what is the spectrum of, of uh, uh, religious beliefs that you, that you embrace? And what is the particular um, 
vision that that uh, the vision of St. Francis gives gives to you about the natural world? Well, Vivi, it's real appropriate, actually, uh, that I'm Franciscan and working in this yeah. work because yeah. it, it's it's like a, a match uh, for for me. And um, the reason is uh, Francis of Assisi, as some people might not know, is um, the patron of ecology and was declared that uh, probably two decades ago, I think. So um, he has this wonderful prayer that is a canticle, because he was a troubadour in his time, actually, and Assisi, and he was kind of a wild youth and, and kept some of that wildness, but transferred <laughs> it to good works. Um, but the canticle of creation really speaks of everything as brother and sister, like um, brother son, yes. sister water, yes. sister holy mother earth, um, you know, all of those elements. As And it's not just flowery language. He knew that in the depths of his soul. Of his soul. He spent um, over half of his life in, in caves praying. Right, right, right. And then he was a reformer, taking that contemplative aspect into action in the world, which is really what I, as a Franciscan, feel I'm called to. Um, most people don't know about uh, Claire, St. Claire of Assisi, mm -hmm. And um, she also was on that path. She was a reformer. And uh, in fact, um, went up against great obstacles even to get her rule approved by the Pope. Um, but in addition to that, she had a sensitivity to the natural world as well. In her uh, rule, she has a part that says, you know, the sisters need to have as much land as they need for protection in their enclosure because they were cloistered at the time because it was such violent times. Mm -hmm. But they need to only cultivate as much as they need. They're not to get anything extra, which speaks to lifestyle and is a lesson for us today. And um, they need to leave the rest wild as God created it. So those elements are there. And then also within Franciscanism is this, um, uh, you know, uh, interfaith element. Like uh, Francis went to the Saracens um, um, to try to negotiate peace. Um, and so there is this whole inner religious dialogue, so to speak, that Francis kind of was part of. So in my work with Interfaith Power and Light, we have a variety of faith traditions. And in fact, all and, and any are welcome. On our board, for instance, we have um, all the major uh, Protestant denominations, Episcopal, Catholic, Mennonite, Mormon, Baha'i, um, Jewish, um, Buddhist, and uh, and we feel that in our conflictual world, if there's any place that we can come together and witness um, to a, in a powerful way for um, the earth, for the human community in the future, it is around the earth and the environment. We all have that in common. And within all of the sacred teachings of all the religious traditions, there are uh, commands that we care for the earth that's been given to us, whether it's Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, Baha'i, uh, Catholic, um, Methodist, um, Evangelical, so all of them. So I know you have a very crisp, uh, handsome mission statement and uh, uh, on your website, um, which is an excellent thing to go look at, incidentally, if you'd like to go look at it. Um, could, you, could you discuss your mission statement and, and sort of give it to us in a compact way and then we'll expand on it a little bit later. The mission of New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light really follows the mission of the national organization Interfaith Power and Light, which is a uh, religious voice uh, caring for creation and addressing climate change in an interfaith way. And we have three prongs that we work on, um, education and inspiration uh, in uh, faith communities and also with individuals. Um, engagement and action with people of faith and their uh, faith communities. And that action is through uh, energy efficiency, conservation of water, solar, uh, food production, respecting local food. And then the third element is uh, public policy advocacy at uh, the local, state, and the federal level. And so that kind of comprises, in a nutshell, you know, our work and what we try to do. And, and so there's a place for everybody under that umbrella, actually. Right. Even if there are people that have a hard time believing that climate change is a reality, well, we're all commanded to care for creation. And there are many ways of doing that. And the future generations really need that. 
I know you've had lots of success here and lots of success stories, and I'd like to ask you about those later on, but I want to go right now to a piece that you wrote in the National Catholic Reporter on immigrant children and the impact of climate change uh, exacerbating both poverty and uh, political violence uh, uh, in the places that they are fleeing. Uh, you wrote um, uh, that the 60-plus children, immigrant refugees who have fled from Honduras, uh, El Salvador, and Guatemala this year, um, their, the immediate causes of their escapes uh, and of their need to escape being political instability, gang violence related to past U.S. military policies and current drug cartels, the underlying issue of poverty exacerbated by coal, environmental degradation and increased climactic weather events barely reaches a headline. Can you talk about that a little bit? You know, I think most people um, don't realize that some of the political unrest that is happening throughout the world is directly related to the environment and specifically to the climate change, um, more exacerbated weather events that, that we're having. The Pentagon, for over 10 years, has said that the greatest uh, national international security threat is climate change. And uh, with the situation with all of these um, immigrant children and mothers and families coming from um, Central America, um, you can trace back greater poverty and destabilization even to like Hurricane Mitch, for instance. So the farmers um, were, were devastated then and have continued to suffer from um, deluges of rain, other um, hurricane tropical storms, and so with that, they become poorer and poorer because they don't have crops. So they want their children to live, and so they send them forth. They um, mortgage their farmland. The farmland then, they can't, they can't pay the child's transportation forward. So the, the drug cartel is involved in this with the transporting the, the coyotes, the travel. And so they lose their land so we have a whole confluence of issues, and, and the environmental part is, is very strongly uh, within that. Um, in the community that I live in, we often open our doors to women for a variety of reasons. And uh, we had a Nicaraguan woman living with us who was working for an NGO for uh, almost um, a year. And this was about seven years ago when there were some of these events happening. Her, her uh, brothers are farmers in Nicaragua. And it was like she said, you know, they've had their whole crop devastated again. Um, she didn't have much money, but she said, I, I feel like I have to send money to them because my mother and my brothers, and what are they going to do? Um, uh, you know, uh, the coming here from the violence, the poverty, I, I have personal experience of people that I know from Central America that that's happened. So I, I think in this country we need to have a, a deeper analysis uh, you know, there's that uh, uh, wonderful, and I, we don't get cable, so I haven't seen it. I only saw the free first edition of it. But uh, that climate um, story that's, that's on uh, A Year of Living Dangerously. Yeah. And it was poignant for me to hear one of those um, interviewers in that that was going through the years said that if you go back to the history of this unrest in Syria, you will see that it stems to farmers um, living through unprecedented drought, and their government was not able to respond to that. They were going to, when it comes, if you're living, if you have water, if you have food, you're going to somehow um, try to survive somehow. And so that that was one of the deep instigators, you know, of that situation. And I was really surprised to hear that, but yeah. that was in that story. So I, I I think all of these issues that we're facing are are really related to our environment, which we are part of, and climate change increasingly so. And um, you know maybe in a little while I'll talk about the climate pilgrimage that we're going to be having here in oh, Albuquerque. Yes. Should I talk about that? Yes, do. Okay. Yes, yes, so um, one of the ways that we're addressing that here in Albuquerque. Um, September 23rd, there's going to be a high-level climate meeting in, uh, at the UN in New York, 
and it's with um, world leaders, with major business leaders, and with the civ civilian society. And it's one of the very important meetings uh, leading up to the path to Paris right. and the UN climate meeting in Paris uh, that ends in 2015, the end of that year, whereby hopefully not just hopefully, but we desperately and we have to have some kind of binding climate uh, agreement to address our greenhouse gas emissions. So anyway, here in New Mexico, and they're having a, a, an enormous um, march in New York on the 21st of September. But we, this is too far to go, <laughs> and so, and for a variety of reasons, including our carbon footprints. So um, we're planning, uh, and it's a real huge co coalition of groups here in Albuquerque. We're planning what's called um, the Climate Pilgrimage Connecting the Dots, yes. where we're going to be starting um, at Immaculate Conception um, Church, and but we're going to be walking through downtown and ending at Robinson Park with the um, at the farmers market. But we're going to be stopping at places that symbolize like um, the immigration refugee issue connected to climate change, um, the security issue at the Veterans Peace Garden, and uh, food security, and those veterans that are working there on that um, issues of. Um, positive things like uh, the lead, we're, we're hopefully stopping at uh, a LEED certified building uh, in downtown yeah. to um, highlight solar and water conservation, energy, um, and that that's a way into the future and one of the paths that we need to uh, connect with that. Um, our energy, um, the economy, and jobs. So we're linking all of those things in this pilgrimage uh, march. It's open to everybody and all kinds of environmental and non-environmental social service etc groups are engaged um so we hope everybody comes comes out and joins us and learns a lot but also makes a statement that this is a big concern for us would you uh would you tell us once again when it is where it is what time it starts and how we get involved with it so the the climate pilgrimage connecting the dots is going to be saturday september 20th and it begins at 9 o'clock, and we're going to begin with um, doing a little uh, piece where people can write notes or an advocacy issue that we're going to have. The actual stepping off the ground starts at 9.30 until 11. Oh, and so we're meeting at Immaculate Conception. There's plenty of parking there, and it's also near the um, Farmer's Market, which is where we're going to end up, the Farmer's Market in Robinson. And it's only a mile and a half. Okay. We're going to we hope to have um, really lively international music um, as we walk to help us um, make the connection with the UN climate meetings, yeah. and that this is an international issue, as well as very local issue. And uh, locally, we've certainly been feeling that with the the drought that we've had, and even now the blessing of the rain, the deluges that we have every year, even in the midst of the the drought, that then um, has a, a deep impact on those communities where fires have been. Yes, yes. And uh, the people at, at Santa Clara Pueblo, for instance, every year when they're are those deluges they are suffering and they can't get the forest reforested so there's 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 links at the very very local level as well internationally with our brothers and sisters that we really if we say that we love one another we need to be putting that in action in many different dimensions i know that a lot of your success stories have to do with alternative energy uh, so i'd love you to sort of maybe talk a little bit about alternative energy from your perspective, and then maybe we can segue into some of the more recent success stories because it's a long list. Um, one of the hopes for the future, I think, uh, and as we look at the children and what we're trying to pass on the children as a legacy, uh, really is a movement into a new paradigm and a new place. Part of that is renewable energy. Yeah. It's also uh, really amping up our energy efficiency. So it's the energy efficiency that we really have to do, conservation in all kinds of ways, and there's a long history of that kind of stewardship in all faith traditions. And then um, solar and wind and uh, gardening and um, uh, new methods of uh, even food production. 
And so with that, Interfaith Power and Light really tries to work with faith communities to educate them about some of those things, to see, oh, these are possibilities. And then with that, it's also addressing an economic issue because many houses of worship and and individuals, you know, this is a poor state in New Mexico, many individuals um, could benefit financially from this movement in these areas. So with houses of worship and some schools, they're really interested in it because it's caring for the future, it's caring for God's creation, and it is helping their budget. And so we have several success stories that speak around that. And um, several of the more recent ones, um, Our Lady of the Most Holy Rosary, uh, just a, a little over a year ago, and they're not a wealthy parish. They're a working class, you know, lower you know, lower income levels of families. And they had a whole education process looking at this. They decided, yes, we have to go with this for the future, for caring for the earth, and for our budget. They are saving, I don't remember the figures, but well over $1,000 a month. Wow. Um, some months much more than that. They installed about 260 Masomenos panels. Uh, which is quite solar yeah solar panels wow. on on their uh, facilities, and um, and it's a wonderful thing and uh, and the community did not say no to it they were really pleased that it was happening, um, St Teresa's School um, there is a wonderful principal over there Donna Illerbrun and she um, worked. Um, for over three years, I met with a whole group of faith communities initially to say, you know, how might we move this forward? And so she was on board right away. We had the meeting at her school, and she did the energy efficiency things. Um, they're trying to do um, awareness of food and growing food. And so they just dedicated uh, around Earth Day uh, panels on their school. And they did a fundraiser to raise the more than $100,000 to do that. Because uh, nonprofits cannot benefit from tax credits. We can get some of the rebates, but at this point, there is no legislation that says we can benefit from those tax credits. So those uh, people of faith in houses of worship that do this are really committed to doing this if they're purchasing the panels outright. Mm. So she's another success story. Um, St. Mark's uh, Episcopal Church has gone through all the energy efficiency. They utilized a no-interest revolving loan fund that we had to jumpstart their energy efficiency and their lighting program. They worked with p and to do Quicksaver. Now they're moving on to solar. And so they're in the process. So somewhere close by, St. Bede's Episcopal Church in uh, Santa Fe is in the process of looking solar. Um, we did energy assessment, so they're working on that. Another success story that is just kind of really fun and interesting, and you never know what's going to happen. I just want to tell them this is about Gallup. Oh, good. So in Gallup, there's um, a Marino sister that I work with closely, Sister Rosemary, and then there are a couple of other people that um, have been involved in a program that we had in the past called Stewards of Creation. So Betsy Windish and B. Sargent, who is an artist, and um, Pat Sheely. So um, Jane Goodall was invited to um, be here in Albuquerque for an event that, um, oh, several years ago. And um, Ray Powell, uh, whom I know, invited me to come and invite anyone else. So I invited them from Gallup. We all went. We were so inspired by her and her love. And, and just exuding this. And so uh, we had lunch, and we said, you know, we have to move with solar, and nobody else is going to do it for us. We don't know that much, but we have to do something. We have to start Gallup Solar. And so I said, yes. I said, I can't be in Gallup. I'm here. I'm supporting you. That's how Gallup Solar started. Good Lord. By this kind of faith, um, inspirational initiative of Jane Goodall, and they are doing all kinds of creative things there. They've just opened a little store that has solar kinds of things. They're doing an entrepreneurial thing. They're, they're putting solar on roofs. Uh, and, and that's in a low-income area. Yeah. And outreach to our Navajo brothers and sisters that many of them don't have electricity. So um, you never know what's going to happen <laughs> if you're open and open to the spirit and to the inspiration, creativity of the earth and the holy so, you know, a lot of us have been talking about local food for a long time. And uh, it's always, I remember there was a um, terrible snowstorm here maybe three or four or five years ago where um, the 18-wheelers couldn't get in with all, all the food. And Santa Fe grocery stores 
it all turns out had about a week of food and they were almost running out. So I think a lot of a lot of people got very practically interested in local agriculture. What um, what what can be done? Do you think is it possible uh, to actually um, support uh, a a truly useful, pragmatic local food production that really feeds a lot of people? I mean, is that possible? Do you think? You know, I I think that local food production and supporting local food production and eating in a healthy way is not only possible, it's essential, and it's a moral act. Um, I was on the National Catholic Rural Life Board for a while, and there is a project they have called Eating is a Moral Act. And um, I think of people living in very economically challenged countries that support themselves by growing their own food or supporting local agriculture. We have the means here. I live on a very small income because I'm a Franciscan sister, so my budget is really small. And um, yet where I live and we rent, um, we have all kinds of garden and food production. People say, well, I'm too busy. I have too many demands. Well, well, I and the sister I live with are really busy. <laughs> and we somehow find time to do this because it's sacramental. It's life-giving. Mm. I couldn't do the work that I do mm. if I couldn't each day see the bees buzzing about on the flowers, on this, on the, you know, the um, the squash, the tomato plants, the um, and the other creatures that are in our yard. And so there are real low-tech ways of creating um, a growing environment that is also water conserving here in the desert and in our state, and also produce a lot of food. Um, With our little garden, um, I love the farmer's market, but I don't go there very often in the summer. And if I do, it's just to walk around and say hello to people because we have enough produce for ourselves, and we can. I I mean, can uh, tomatoes. In my life, because I come from a farm in Kansas, and we canned everything that we needed for the entire winter, I feel like life is not complete unless I do some food preservation every year. So there's the tomatoes, and then there's the plums, and there's the apricot jam, and then there's wow. the squash, and the, some chilies, and you know, and then we have the chickens in the back, and the eggs that we give away or we sell some to people, and they love those eggs. Um, I think it just takes a real commitment to loving. I mean, all of these things we're talking about, PB, really, are about loving. Yeah. And if we say that we really love um, our families, we really love our neighbors, I really love my friends, I really love God's creation, um, it means I'm, we, we sacrifice. We change our priorities a little bit. We do things a little bit differently for anyone and that that we love. And that's really what it comes down to. So yes, I believe local food is possible. Um, Living here in in an arid region, it calls forth um, real creativity and I think innovation and some ways that we could even model things for other places in the world if we really took that on. Um, And as a viable economic um, kind of thing and um, health and for health as well. So you're gonna have uh, your annual meeting this year and um you're going to have a key speaker who's going to talk about investment and de-investment. That sounds fascinating. Uh, NMIPL has its annual meeting in the fall usually, and so we're having it in November, and it's going to be November 15th. We're still finding the place and the exact time. It'll be late in the afternoon. But this whole area of uh, divestment and uh, reinvestment or investing in other ways, focusing around the fossil fuel industry is something that is growing in uh, not just interest, but uh, really in commitment uh, to within uh, faith communities of all religious traditions. A number of them this summer even at their high-level meetings met and chose to um, divest from fossil fuel in their uh, portfolios. Um, The Unitarians have gone that route, and I I don't want to make any mistakes because I can't remember. I get some of these confused. So um, the Unitarians, I want to say the Presbyterians, the United Church of Christ has. uh, um, I'm not sure about the Episcopalians, but some of the others are also talking about that. So we have a guest speaker, Fletcher Harper, 
and he is the director of a group called Green Faith and uh, Interfaith Power and Light. You know, um, like we share ideas and resources and stuff with with Green Faith, and so um, he is going to be coming. And he is excellent. He's been working on this with faith communities. He's excellent in the practicalities of it, not only for houses of worship but for individuals as well, and. Um, and then coming at it from a theological or faith perspective also. So people are most welcome to come to that. Uh, again, it's November 15th. It's going to be late in the afternoon, and our website will have the information. We also celebrate some of those success stories you talked about at yeah. that event. So we'll be doing that. And, um, yeah, and there's one other thing that's just kind of burning that I should sure. tell you. Sure. You know, we are working um, in support of this EPA standards right now that's in the hearing process or the comment process yeah. for coal-fired power plants. Good. And um, and we're working, and there has been really, it's really kind of heartening because um, the religious traditions at high levels have come out in support of this. The Lutherans and Episcopals, the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops came out with uh, a statement as soon as it came out said, we're in support of this. Um, all of these different uh, religious traditions. And so we're working with faith communities to get um, signatures on um, a petition that we have um, by the end of September. We're also working getting um, signatures of faith leaders in New Mexico. Actually, in the Southwest, we're working collaboratively. Um, you know, Senator Udo, when we met with him several years ago, said, is there any way that Interfaith Power and Light might work you know, in your in our region, just uh, collectively on some of these issues, so that those other states will maybe, uh, so that the the political leaders will see the faith community is really concerned about this regionally because we all share together uh, concern over water, in terms of climate change, and the droughts, and so we're working collectively to get um, faith leader signatures on that too. So there's lots going on: the divestment, the reinvestment the new guidelines on coal-fired power plants, moving to uh, a new future where, where it really shows that we are putting our love into action for everybody. So this has been a wonderful conversation. I'd just like to ask you one more question, if we could. What do you think uh, uh, is the most important thing all of us can do right now environmentally uh, to, uh, to help all of us as well as ourselves? Um, the most important thing to do, my answer is probably different than maybe you would think. The most important thing is to love. And for whatever that loving is, and in reflecting on that loving, let it take me to the next step of what I need to do to address climate change. That may be something very personal in my life with my family. And I'd invite, is your loving really mean brothers and sisters and those other people as well. And and that moves us to the next step of some kind of advocacy because we have to be moving and amping this up for changes um, with um, guidelines for um, reduction of carbon emissions, of uh, amping up um, renewable energy, of local food production, all of those things. But it has to come not out of fear, and not out of, I should be doing this, or being hammered over the head with the facts, because that's not moving us anywhere. Um, and people aren't responding in this country. It has to come from that deep, deep place that's a spiritual place, um, a personal place of what is it that I love that I am willing to make some sacrifice for, I'm willing to put myself on the line for, and I'm willing to act. Joan, thank you so much. It's been inspiring. And eye-opening and exciting, and I'm just thrilled to have had you here today. And perhaps we can do this again in the future uh, when things, new things coalesce. And... Well, I thank you for letting me come, inviting me. I mean, it's been wonderful just to chat with you and about something that's really very important and, and dear to both of our hearts and, and to the hearts of everybody in New Mexico, I believe. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor. And many blessings to many you. Blessings to thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.